MEI is proud to present Egypt After Mubarak, Challenges and Opportunities in Egyptian Politics, featuring Bruce K. Rutherford. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. I wanted to start off first off by thanking uh, the Middle East Institute for agreeing to host this event. I've been a great admirer of the Middle East Institute for many years, not only uh, because of its activities, but also because of its excellent journal, uh, the Middle East Journal, which I'm sure all of you are aware of, uh, which is one of the leading sources of insight and one of the leading sources of high quality analysis of the contemporary Middle East. I've always wondered what institution was behind the Middle East Journal, uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here and, and to actually see the resources and the people who stand behind that terrific publication. I wanted to thank as well um, Emily Sachs and Mikel Rodriguez from the U.S. Egypt Friendship, Friendship Society, who very kindly were the individuals who invited me to come join you uh, this afternoon. I've been down to speak at another U.S. EF event a few years ago and enjoyed it very much. It's a great pleasure and a great honor uh, to have an opportunity to meet Mr. Khalifa again. I, I actually met you on my previous visit yeah, as well, yeah. so it's nice to see you again uh, and to see many other familiar faces as well. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit different from what Mr. Khalifa suggested in his opening remarks. In other words, I'm not going to get into the intricacies of who will succeed Hosni Mubarak, although we can discuss that during the discussion period if you're interested. But what I, I'm going to try to do instead is to try and talk about some of the broader trends that are shaping Egyptian politics, and in, in general terms, to lay out the structural challenges uh, that any successor to Hosni Mubarak is going to face, regardless of who it is. Um, in particular, I'm going to focus on what I consider to be the three core structural challenges that any future president of Egypt must confront uh, and which the United States must cope with when uh, deciding on an appropriate policy toward Egypt. Uh, the first, and I think probably the most obvious of these, is a demographic challenge. Egypt's current population is about 83 million, and it's growing at a rate of about 2% per year, which means the population is going to double by the year 2039. It's particularly important to keep in mind that for much of the 1980s and 1990s, the population growth rate was actually 3%, uh, or in the vicinity of 3%, uh, which produced what demographers call a demographic bubble, in other words, large numbers of young people. Uh, at this particular juncture, roughly 40% of Egypt's population is under the age of 25 years. Uh, in essence, you have lots of young people born in the 1980s and 1990s who are now reaching an age where they're looking for jobs, housing, and public services. And jobs, in particular, simply aren't there in sufficient numbers. The official unemployment rate is roughly 10%. The unofficial rate is in the vicinity of 20%. But there are specific segments of the workforce uh, where the unemployment rate is remarkably high. Uh, for example, there was a UND rep UNDP report in 2008 uh, which concluded that unemployment among young people with secondary school diplomas is roughly 60%. Unemployment for college graduates is over 25%. One of the more striking statistics that captures the demographic challenge facing Egypt is the observation that the country needs to create about 600,000 new jobs per year simply to keep the unemployment rate at its current level. In recent years, the best the economy could do was 500,000 new jobs. Uh, that was in 2007 when Egypt had a 7% growth rate. And the growth rate, of course, has declined recently as a result of the global financial crisis. Uh, this demographic fact has both economic and political repercussions that I'll talk about a bit further in a moment. But the regime's primary response to this demographic challenge uh, has been economic reform, which is the second structural change I want to talk about. Since the early 1990s, and especially since 2004, the regime's undertaken very substantial and wide-ranging economic restructuring. It's tried to shift from a state-dominated and state-controlled economy to one in which the private sector and market forces guide economic development. Toward this end, the government's adopted new laws regarding labor relations, property rights, formation of companies, capital markets, and banking in an effort to shift the country toward a more competitive and market-oriented economy. There's also been significant privatization of public enterprises. Uh, the public sector shrank from 39 percent of GDP in 1992 to 28 percent in 2000 and has continued to decline. These reforms have produced impressive macroeconomic results. There's been a sharp reduction in inflation and the budget deficit. Economic growth in the latter part of the 1990s averaged 5 percent. It reached as high as 7 percent in uh, 2007. But it's also produced some negative repercussions. There's been a significant rise in unemployment in some sectors of the economy, um, particularly the public sector enterprises where firms have downsized their workforces as part of the privatization process. There's also been rising inequality. As, competitive, as a competitive economy naturally favors workers with higher skills and training and leaves behind those workers without the skills and training needed to compete. Growing worker resistance to privatization has been manifest in wildcat strikes. Um, keep in mind that under Egyptian law, um, strikes in principle are supposed to be approved uh, effectively by the government. Uh, there have been 
by some estimates, as many as 200 strikes in the past year that have been taken place without government approval. Some observers put the figure significantly higher than that. Uh, the, the difference in the number is essentially a function of how you define a labor action. Um, but the, it seems to me the, under, the point to underscore here is that there's been meaningful and growing public anxiety, um, particularly among the workers most affected by privatization. But also more generally, there have been demonstrations as well related to rising food prices and to the declining purchasing power of salaries. It seems to me the key point here is that coping with the social dislocations and tensions that are produced by economic reform has become one of the central challenges facing the government and will be a core challenge facing any successor to Hosni Mubarak. The third core structural trend that I think is very important for shaping the future of Egyptian politics has been the rise of political Islam, both as a social and political movement. Islamic groups such as the Muslim Brotherhood have created large and sophisticated networks uh, that provide a wide range of social services uh, to their members and by, doing, by so doing create a large pool of potential political supporters. In addition, Islamist thinkers have developed an increasingly robust conception of governance and politics that provides a plausible and popular alternative uh, to the nationalism and statism of the regime. In essence, political Islam has increasingly developed into both an institutional and ideological alternative to the regime, and its appeal has grown as the regime has proved less and less capable of meeting the public's needs. In order to cope with these three structural challenges, the regime needs both an economic strategy and a political strategy. The economic strategy is fairly well developed and, and fairly robust. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, market-oriented economic reform has produced good economic performance. The country has managed to weather the recent global financial crisis remarkably well. Um, most economists estimate the economy will grow by about 4% this year, which is remarkably better than either Europe or the United States or, and much else in the developing world and many other countries in the developing world. Uh, the regime has also attempted to cope with some of the negative repercussions of economic reform that I mentioned a few moments ago by adopting programs to retrain redundant workers, by granting loans to help workers that have been displaced in order to help them establish their own businesses, and by allowing dismissed workers to retain access to subsidized housing and medical care while they look for new jobs. The implementation of some of these measure measures has been uneven, as, as one might expect given the scale of the challenge, but nonetheless there is a program in place, there are significant resources behind it, there is a significant institutional commitment to the economic side of responding to these three structural challenges. In sharp, sharp contrast, there is uh, relatively little um, strategy in the political arena. Uh, in essence, the regime's political approach to these three challenges has been essentially one of repression. Uh, to essentially shut down virtually every arena for a meaningful political competition, whether it be on university campuses, professional syndicates, the judges' club, political parties, non-governmental organizations, and the Muslim Brotherhood. Political reform is at best seen as a secondary priority. Uh, to give you a clearer idea of the regime's position on political reform, let me recount for you a conversation I had with an Egyptian official a few years ago when I raised this issue of political reform. Uh, in his view, uh, no Egyptian wakes up in the morning wondering about freedom of speech or fairness of elections. Uh, rather, they wake up wondering how they're going to earn enough money uh, to put food on the table, how they're going to get their child into a good school, how they're going to find adequate medical care for their aging parents. Uh, therefore, in the view of this official, uh, the key to stability is to meet those immediate material needs rather than dealing with the more abstract objectives of improving the rule of law or strengthening f uh, fairness of elections. The key to meeting those material needs, in turn, uh, is to undertake economic restructuring that creates jobs and higher incomes. And at the same time, it's necessary for the state to retain wide-ranging security powers in order to maintain order during the socialist dislocations caused by economic reform. In this view, political reform is actually counterproductive because it would create opportunities for the opponents of economic restructuring to organize and block the economic policies needed to build a market economy. The Egyptian gov government's decision to effectively abandon efforts at serious political reform should concern the U.S. for several reasons. The first of these uh, is that the lack of political reform has direct repercussions for the stability of the country. As the process of economic restructuring unfolds, unemployment, inequality, corruption, and poverty have risen. These problems are aggravated by the demographic bubble that I mentioned a few moments ago, which is bringing larger and larger numbers of young people into the labor market at a time when there simply are not enough jobs. The jobs that are available are often distributed based on family connections or other ties rather than merit, which results in even higher levels of frustration among the unemployed. In addition, uh, large numbers of these, these large numbers of young people who are now entering their teens and their 20s are making increasingly rising demands on the state for housing, education, health care, and other social services, demands that the state is increasingly unable to meet, which in turn leads to further aggregation of levels of frustration and anger. 
the clearest evidence of this growing frustration and anger are the growing frequency of the wildcat strikes that I mentioned a few moments ago, but there's other evidence as well. 